Wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, no, wait, how does this work? I'm already, <laughs> you're on me. Thank you for coming on my show. I'm amazed um, that you're able to do that. I'm, I'm really excited. Um, can you tell people a little bit about yourself for people that have been living under a rug and haven't been on TikTok <laughs> or Instagram in the deconstruction space? Um, do you want to maybe give a little bit of a preamble about who you are and maybe some of what you're doing? Um, and then maybe we can go into your story um, and, and kind of talk a bit about like kind of how you got to be where you are now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I go by Eve uh, and I'm actually I feel really new to the whole I don't know what we're calling it, deconstruction, deconversion, you know, whatever I've landed in this very niche lane, I feel like, but um, I'm pretty new. I, I mostly am on TikTok and I try to bring it over to Instagram, but, um, you know, my whole goal is to educate on atheism, on religious trauma, on um, just critical thinking, and just try to spark uh, a little bit of freedom in people's lives. And that's that's my goal on both of those platforms. And I, now I'm trying to figure out Twitter. <laughs> and oh I also started a Facebook page, which I really wish I had never done that. Um, there's a reason I left Facebook. So <laughs> we'll see how long oh, that lasts. I killed my Facebook page about a year ago and I am so happy. Like the amount yeah. of like stress just reduced overnight. Yep. is just undescribable. It, it's, it's a different crowd over there. Yeah, yeah um yeah i don't go on twitter either i find it too much it's just it's just too much there's wow. loads of info and i'm like i just can't deal with this right now it's too much i'm done um i think twitter is <laughs> a very like two-directional platform and i i'm really good at like just dumping something and running away and then right. on my own terms chatting with someone in the dms or something but i don't have time to consume tons and i feel like you have to consume on yeah. twitter right i mean i don't know apparently um, I, i'm that's how i am i like to just dump and then like if i can come back to it i will but that's not going very well for me on Twitter. So right. <laughs> you come back and it's like World War Three on your yes, like, I'm like, feed. Whoa, what like, did I miss? <laughs> yep. Right. And it's bad for me because I, I check in every three months and I'm like, oh, something oh. happened two months ago. I'm like, oh, well, it's actually probably right. the best way to do it. Right. Because you're like, oh, right. well, that was an issue for everyone else. But I didn't even know. Um, <laughs> and I bet you no one cares about it two months later. Um, yeah. Well, like I've got to say, like the, the way you... Um, I, you're new to this space you, you know but you come at it with such profundity like I, I think the way that you put certain things is just so unique so um fantastic and i'm sure a lot of people that have been in atheist spaces and things like that have come across a lot of the ways that you put things i'm sure other people have come up with similar analogies um but to me uh, and i'm just constantly finding oh wow that's such a unique way to look at um yeah, faith and, and deconversion, deconstruction, um, again, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think um, you bring a really unique uh, dynamic to, to the space and, and an important female perspective as well, because again, most of this space is dominated by white men. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's exciting to see, um, yeah, a, a woman out there doing some great stuff. It's, it's exciting. Um, so you. how did... How did you get here? Like, you know, um, I, I know a little bit of your story from following your stuff. Um, and, yeah. and I, I know that you kind of touch on this here and there every now and again. But in, in my experience, most of the stuff you talk about, you kind of talk to points. Um, and so you like look at a certain point and go, oh, look, let's look at this a different differently. Or right. here's me addressing this question or, or whatever. Um, but you have touched on a little bit here and there about some of your journey. But I know a lot of people that are following you probably would love to know a little bit more about how did Eve was framed become Eve was framed right what's the story behind yeah. this because you don't get to the place where you're talking from such um depth from such insight and wisdom but also from such experience without experiencing some serious shit right like you, you yeah. you've walked this out like you're not just like randomly stumbled onto christianity and go oh that's interesting i'll talk about it um right. i don't know anyone that's in that space right like <laughs> most of us have been through some shit um, and so yeah. what was your experience? How did, how did you grow mm -hmm. up? You know, were you, were you very Christianly raised Christian? Mm -hmm. uh. Oh yeah. Very Christianly. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, so my parents have actually been evangelical pastors, ministers, authors, all of that. Most of my life. Uh, I was homeschooled my whole entire life up until I went to college, which that didn't last long either. Um, I, my whole entire life was evangelical Christianity. At the time, I didn't even know the term evangelicalism. I, I just thought we were real Christians, you know? Right. Um, and, and so, you know, it started with them pastoring like a small local church in Atlanta where I grew up. Uh, and then 
my family, my dad specifically got really into the seven mountain, um, dominionism theology, you know, right. all, everyone Is that Lance Walno kind of stuff. Yes. And those are the people yeah. I grew up around. Um, that's, you know, my, my parents, peers, and those are the conferences right. they were speaking at all the time. So that is how I, I grew uh, up, you know, in my team. So for people that aren't familiar with that, like, can you give yeah. like a broad kind of overview? Because it's a fascinating yeah. way. I mean, it's, it's white supremacy through and through, right? I mean, it, it's, in a it's nutshell, brilliant it's white supremacy, like, really. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but a lot of people won't have come across this, um, yeah. or at least won't explicitly be aware of kind of a lot of these teachings that probably are informing a lot of um, people's churches that they've been from. Right. So basically, Seven Mountain Theology uh, or Dominionism Theology, they, everybody has different names for it. But the seven stands for like the seven different areas of society that these uh, evangelical leaders believe God has told them they need to conquer in order to bring God's kingdom to earth, which that's the way they say it. It's really, like you said, white supremacy. It's Christian nationalism. Um, that's what I always refer to it as, as Christian nationalism. Yeah. But the seven areas are things like media, government, education, family, entertainment. I don't remember the other two, which is awesome because I used to know all of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for me, it was interesting because growing up, you know, probably till I was about, I think it was like 12 or 13 when they got into that theology. But before then, we very much were more sheltered. I, you know, we didn't celebrate Halloween. We didn't watch movies or listen to music. That was the main thing. I, I loved music. I sang and, and I wanted to listen to other music and I was only allowed to listen to Christian music. Mm. I wanted to get into acting. I wanted to be a famous singer. You know, I had all these, you know, typical young child dreams of being famous. I was obsessed with Mary Kate and Ashley. And I was taught that that was evil. Like God wow. uses people that work in the church only. And I needed to mm. be, you know, like a worship leader or a pastor's wife, something like that. So when my parents started getting into or had their revelation of this theology, they actually apologized to me for shutting that thing down. Right. And said, actually, we think you're right. God wants to use you to right. Come into you could take mountain. Hollywood. You can take over exactly. the top forty. You know, for Jesus, right? Right. Yeah. So that's that was. Um, so at first, I really embraced that. I was like, "This is awesome. I get more freedom now." And my dad's whole thing was like, "You don't have to be in the church to be important to God. Like, actually, He can use you in whatever area you are skilled at, wherever your your calling is. Um, right. That's where He wants you to be." So I grew Which, up with all of if that. you take a big enough step back, you know, like that, like a cursory glance at that, you go, oh, that sounds a lot healthier than a lot of people grew up in church, where it is right. like, if you're not part of this church system, um, mm -hmm. you're a second class citizen. And like, let's face it, in a church of 100 people, how many people can be leaders, right? You know, or whatever, yeah. right? You, there's so many people are immediately like, well, you're just not as important, <laughs> where from a cursory glance, you go, oh, wow, that really empowers a lot of people. Like I know, cause I, yeah. I remember looking at it going, this is a really healthy way to see things. It's yeah. better than the pastor's the best. And only being a pastor is the way to really fulfill the best calling on earth. Right. Um, you know, someone that wants to act is just as important. Someone that wants to work yeah. in a business just as important. Um, but yeah, but there's this really <laughs> scary Sinister, kind of under, underlying yeah. kind of thing that runs through it. Um, yeah, sorry. I just, cause I, yeah. I, I even hear you describe it. I'm like, yeah, it does sound good. I've, I talked right. to a lot of people that are in churches every day and I'm like, and if they had had something like that, maybe they wouldn't have had as many causes to deconstruct at yeah. least on a cursory, uh, glance on a, on a very, um, on a very soft level. Right. You know, yeah. if they really dove in, I'm sure very quickly, they'd be like, Whoa, there's some issues here. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. no, I love it. Please, anytime. Um, I think that's what made it why I didn't immediately start questioning this. Also, I was a very young teenager. Um, but there is a lot to it that is healthier than other stuff going on in other churches. I thought mm. we were really progressive. And and my family, you know, they're actually a very like healthy, emotionally healthy, uh, functional family compared to a lot of stories that I hear coming out of evangelicalism. Yeah. So you know, I, I have to credit them for that. And I think that comes through in, in their, what I consider very toxic theology. There are still some parts that are uh, needed uh, in that, in the evangelical world. So growing up with that was very, very strange. Um, I thought that my calling was going to be to be some great 
you know, taking the mountain for God type situation. <laughs> right. And, um, and my parents started kind of branching out a little further and further from our local church and then finally ended up leaving the church, which I was so excited for. I hated growing mm. up in church. I mean, I, I did a great job with it. I was, I was a really good kid. I, um, I led worship every weekend. I uh, participated in youth group. I helped lead youth group. I helped the children's ministry. I was on the prophetic teams, which is a whole other thing. Um, but I, you know, I was very involved and I was just like, this is so, I was so over it. This is so boring. And I hated right. being the, um, uh, I don't know, the kind of like golden child of the church. Right. Um and this I, pressure for being a PK. I'm a PK as well. Yeah, and like, it yeah. is, it is a whole different thing. Like you, you meet other totally. PKs and you're like, oh, you get it. You get what it was like to grow up with all eyes on you and you right. have to be on and you've got to tick all the boxes. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's, it's a weight. Um, yeah. It can be a great thing in, in many ways, I'm sure. But yeah, it, it's just a different experience for sure. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. tell you, and it's very much like being in a fishbowl kind of situation and, um, and I saw a lot of my peers, it went very badly for them. And I, I hate it. They struggle with so many issues now, addiction and all kinds of stuff. And yet they're also still very involved in church. So I don't know, it just, um, it's a tough thing to go through. Luckily, for whatever reason, my personality, I was like, all right, I got this. And I did it. And mm. I learned a lot. Um, but I hated it. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I yeah. actually, I skipped a part right before they left the church. It's like a big part that I skipped. Um, I grew up in purity culture with the whole like I kiss dating goodbye I had never dated anybody. I had never even held hands with anyone. I was 18. And one of my best friends from childhood confessed his feelings to me. And I was like, oh, I'm 18. This is about when my dad always told me I get married. I guess this is it. Oh, my <laughs> so, God. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that's a long story short. But it basically was like that. Um, and we right. started courting and uh, which is, you know, basically when you say you're dating, but you're for sure going to get married and it lets all the elders have their opinion about your relationship right. and stuff. Did, did he ask uh, your dad's permission to begin courting you? To go oh yeah. Had the whole conversation, uh, which yet he, he lived in another state. So he had to like drive in oh, overnight and come ask his permission. And it was this whole thing, which he, it's asked next my level. Mom and my dad's yeah. My, my see again, we were like progressive because you had to ask my mom's permission too. So it was wow. this whole, <laughs> It's yeah. not just your dad that owns you. Right, exactly. <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> so, I, yeah, that happened. And and a lot of that for me was also, I found a way out. And not like a way out like, oh, I hate my parents and I want to get away from them. Although I do think in your teen years, there's always a bit of that. But mm. more so like this life, like I felt so constricted and like I was never able to really be myself. And I couldn't put a finger on what it was. My, my parents would even ask me like, why? What are you not happy about? What do you want to do that you're not able to do? And now I've been able to unpack all of that. <laughs> it was yeah. my religious trauma, but I wanted to get out and, and getting married seemed like a really great way to do that. I was like, oh, I can be independent now and make my own decisions. I didn't take into account the fact that you answered to your husband. <laughs> right. It's a transfer of ownership. It's not really exactly. the freedom card. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, um, and I was being transferred over to someone who had way worse religious trauma than I even had. I, I mm. didn't obviously realize at the time, but, um, and my heart still goes out to him. So I don't share a lot about that because that's his journey. And I think he's still on it, but, uh, you know, we were also kids and it was just an awful situation. Um, mm. very awful. And I immediately, even in my naivety was like, this isn't healthy and I should not stay in this. This is toxic. Um, and, you know, within a year, I finally went to my parents, very long story short, and I said, I cannot stay in this. I'm scared. I want out. Uh, please help me. And and they did. But also, there was definitely the underlying thing of, well, this makes us look really bad to the church right now. Like, wow. having to send a mass emails to the church explaining my situation and everything I did was a big email, like promises courting someone. And now she's dating or now they're getting married and all that stuff. So having to have that come out was a, was a big deal. The divorce, mm. which we never called it a divorce. We called it an annulment, oh, <laughs> but wow. it was a divorce. Yeah. Yeah. So we did that and, um, everybody sided with my, my ex, uh, they had like prayer meetings for him that they would have him come to, um, because he was fighting for our marriage, but right. 
that didn't mean anything. <laughs> it was, right. it was like toxic and we both needed out, but he was like doing the things. So, uh, and I was sleeping on the couches of old friends that I hadn't seen in years, but they were the ones taking me in. My youth leader wasn't, my worship pastor wasn't, my, you know, my own family. They were like, I think we need space right now. So that was a big deal to me. That is when I realized, oh wait, the church that's been there for me my whole life is not actually here for me. As soon as I do something that doesn't fit into their idea of who they wanted me to be, which was definitely not divorced at 19, um, then they want space. They want to be removed from me. Yeah. And that was that's, huge. I, that's go ahead. No, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about it. I'm, I'm seeing it from a different perspective because I, I was the guy that fought for a marriage and uh -huh. wanted it to work when my mm -hmm. wife was like, this is not healthy. We're just not healthy. People. It wasn't particularly abusive. It wasn't particularly harmful. We just didn't really click. And we got married because we we're supposed to. It's a Christian thing. Yeah. You date someone and whatever. It's prophesied and all these different things, right? Um, and looking at it, and I've, I've processed this a lot over the years, but you look at it and you go, man, people sided with me so easily because I... I did go, you know, but we should make it work. You know, even if it's not great, yeah. like it can be great. We can figure it out. Not looking at like, Hey, but why would you work so hard at something when you could actually just be free mm -hmm. to do something that's going to be for, healthy for you both. Um, yeah. And so I came to that conclusion fairly quickly, like within months, which, which was probably better than some, <laughs> but right. it was probably yeah, shit for my, my wife at the time, kind of processing this and, and wanting to be free. Um, and, and it's just really fascinating looking back going, yeah, like people sided with me quickly, but wow. demonized her because she was like, hey, this isn't healthy. Never mind the fact yeah. that you had like trained clinical professionals that are, you know, working with us doing therapy and going, hey, honestly, you guys would be happier doing something different. Go find someone yeah. else to be with, you know, that's a bit healthier and a bit more your style, your, your mm -hmm. background, you know, how you operate in this world. Like, you know, professionals were saying this shouldn't work, but the church is going, no, it has right. to work. That's the rules. To. And if, if there's a side to pick, it's we very quickly will pick on the side that makes it work. You see, it's, I mean, we see the church yes. supporting abusive marriages and things like that. You're just sending yeah. women back in or men back into uh, harmful situations yeah. um, because you're married. You need to make it work. Um, it's just really... Yeah. So I, I just, as you're talking, I'm just like, Oh yeah. Interesting. That's so interesting to hear. Yeah. The other side of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, it, they did side really quickly. Um, yeah. and it, it, yeah, like you said, it's because they have to, uh, cause it has to work. And especially yeah. the pastor's daughter, the pastor's daughter yeah. can't get a divorce and no one in my family. I mean, I have a huge family and I have one aunt like 50 years ago that got a divorce. And so I was the first wow. one and it was a big deal. Yeah. So from there, that's about, you know, shortly after my parents left the church and we haven't really had a conversation about this part, but I, I do think that it even shocked them a bit how that all went down. Um, mm. And I think that that helped them disconnect a little easier. So we all moved out to LA because they were doing the seven mountain thing. They were doing yeah. life coaching for the stars kind of stuff. Um, and I got remarried pretty quickly because, you know, I, I want to have access to my calling and you can't have access to that until you're married. So, <laughs> right. It's, it's interesting that, isn't it? Like we were talking about, so me and my wife were started watching this documentary called escaping polygamy, um, mm. which I'd never heard of. Um, but it's fascinating. It's about people that are leaving this extreme cult of uh, Mormonism and these, these women that have left, but they're helping other people get out. And it's a huge, oh, wow. it's one family with one guy has 200 kids, the main guy. I mean, it's insane. Wow. Uh, 27 wives. And then all those people, and then they kick out the oh, young guys so that the older guys can then marry all these like 14 year old girls. I mean, it's fucking mental. Um, but we were commenting. It's really interesting. These people that have left this cult, almost all of them are, you know, under like 22, 23 yeah. and they're married with kids. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> wow, 23. I don't want to have kids, right? I mean, I'm like, yeah. Dude. Um, but like, it's it's interesting. She's like, why are they like just doing this? So, and I'm like, I, that doesn't leave you. And so it's it's interesting because yeah. the first thing I would think, having been removed from the situation long enough, is right. You got married at 18 because that's the right thing to do, and God wants you to get married <laughs> away. And and then it goes horribly wrong, and you're like, oh shit, that's awful. I'm out. And then you turn around and go, all right, but I got to get married really quick because I'm young yep. and I'm like, you know, and, and it's yeah. fascinating how deep that runs that I guess you could even have something that was clearly not right for you, this marriage. Yeah. And yet 
the default was, oh, I need to get married again. Did you have thoughts on that? Like now looking back on that from a bit more distant? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, cause I was the exact same person. I, um, I've now, like I said, been able to pinpoint that so much of it was just religious trauma, indoctrination. And even though I, I did feel empowered after my divorce, I felt like I did something that broke the mold a little bit and, um, and that helped. And so I think I thought that that meant that I would be fine. And another, like I figured out what's wrong and now I move on, but I didn't, I didn't actually figure out why that didn't work, why it was so toxic, the issues that my ex had and the sort of help he needed and the signs to look for that in someone else. And so I just went straight on to the next. Um, and I think I thought, because this time we dated and I didn't announce it and I kept it secret for a bit because I wanted to feel like it was my decision. Uh, I, I thought that that made it different, Mm. but I was the same exact indoctrinated person just looking for the same things to check off a list that I'd been taught I should look for in a spouse. Um, and mostly I think, again, I wanted the freedom because as soon as I was divorced, I was back under, I wasn't even living with my family and yet I was a hundred percent dependent on them, um, in every way. And I, I, I don't know. I, I think I just wanted to feel again, like I could be my authentic self. And I thought Mm. that the answer was getting married (laughs) and it wasn't. It's, I mean, it is, it runs deep. I mean, I know for me, when I got divorced, I literally, cause I was in ministry at the time and I was traveling and speaking and, you know, I was, I was, um, yeah, I was, I was pretty well known and successful and being divorced, I, I knew, and a big part of why I really fought for the marriage was probably much less about, I want marriage to work than, this comes with like severe costs because to be a successful Christian, you need to be married. Right. I mean, on some level that is communicated one way or another. Right. Um, They don't even put you in leadership in most places unless you're married. Oh no. And then that's as a guy, right. I mean, like, come on, are we kidding? Right. I can still probably power through and be all right. Like I'm a white guy. I'm straight. Like I'll be fine. Right. (laughs) Right? But like when you, when you grow up in with that kind of indoctrination with that kind of um, message continually given, maybe not explicitly, but at least implicitly it is stated very clearly. You are a second class Christian. If you're single, Um, the, the, College of um, King's College in London did a study on evangelicals um, about five, six years ago, and they asked men, do you see yourself, uh, do you see single men less important than uh, married men? And Mm -hmm. they asked women, do you see single men, uh, women less important than married women? And men answered, I think 73% said yes, single men are less important in the kingdom of God. 97% of women said yes about (sighs) are women less important. So, you know, it's, it's there, like you you can say what you like, but that is there. It's a it's message there, that says, yeah. I am not. And then it moves on, right? You get married and then it's like, well, if, if God forbid you're infertile or you decide not to have kids or you choose to focus on a career or whatever, because married women are great, but married women without <laughs> kids, you know, it's, it's right. <laughs> moving on where we've got these like goals, but yeah, I mean, like I can, I can see that it's, sh- it's shocking that we do these things and it's shocking you hear mm-hmm. these stories, but they immediately make sense when you look at the data. It's like, oh, of course you immediately got remarried. Like you were, you were a second class citizen. You didn't have a way to look after yourself. You didn't have the support structures that, you know, you might have if you grew up outside of um, a very fundamental kind of world. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. Sorry, I keep interrupting. That's, that's no, me. I love so it. Get used no, to it. I yeah. love, it's fun hearing this other perspective. <laughs> Um, yeah. And I think a lot of it too, especially the second time around, I was like, I need to pick someone before somebody gets picked for me. Because I also Mm -hmm. grew up with a lot of men approaching my dad when I was a teenager saying that like God gave them a dream. Luckily my dad was always like, no, he didn't. (laughs) Um, but a lot of like that kind of situation. And I think I was so scared of that being my story, which is funny because a lot of my peers dreamed of that being their story. Um, but I was so scared of God showing up to somebody and not to me and telling them that they're supposed to marry me. And then, then I'm stuck with that person. So I wanted to feel like I chose this person. It was definitely like an act of rebellion, um, which I hate that word, but I think it fits in perfectly here. It was like, no, I'm going to pick the person. And yet I'm still like this very deeply unhealthy 20 something year old, very, I think it was, yeah, I was 20. And, um, 
and this will be great this time around. <laughs> and it, it right. wasn't, it was just the other side of the coin of toxicity and, um, and stuff in marriages where you should not be with that person. And so I, we were married, we were all moved out to LA and then, um, things were just so bad in our marriage. And I was so just discouraged with my life at this point. Now it had been a few years. Um, my calling was not looking like it was anywhere close. Uh, I was feeling very far from God because I had decided to leave the church, just like my parents had left their church. I was like, I'm not going to church anymore, but I want to pursue God. I had started experiencing panic attacks for the first time in my life. Didn't even know that's what they were. Kept going to the ER, kept telling them like, I have a brain tumor. I have a heart attack. I have something going on. And finally, this really kind doctor sat me down. He said, you have anxiety. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> what are you talking about? I don't have anxiety. These things, I really feel them. They're happening. He said, I know. He said, you have some things you need to work out and your body is letting you know right now. And that you're in your twenties. This makes sense. Try some medication. I was like, no, I will never try medication. Right. And um, meanwhile, my parents and everyone is telling me, get in your worship closet. I have like my prayer closet, turn on worship music, pray, read the word over and over out loud. And I did that obsessively. Mm. Um, for months, I literally would just be like fetal position, holding my Bible, reading verses out loud until the panic attack would pass. And I would think that that meant like, oh, I, I read this Psalm so many times and it worked, (laughs) Right. but really I wasn't learning any coping skills. And finally I decided one time it was so bad, uh, to try one of the medications he gave me. And instantly I started crying. I said, oh my God, I feel like myself for the first time in like a year. Wow. Like I just feel normal. Um, so that going through that started sparking, you'll see like the different things that happened along my life that started sparking some like subliminal questions that I didn't quite get out yet, but it definitely laid right. the foundation for it. Um, and I, I guess I got a little clarity at, you know, not conquering my anxiety, but, you know, kind of getting a grip on it at that point. And I told my husband at the time, like, I want to go to Bethel School of Ministry. This is a big church in California. Um, It was eight hours north of us. And my family is very close with the pastors there. And my sisters had gone there, had friends there. And I saw that their lives seemingly were getting on track when they went there. Mm. (laughs) They were, um, becoming pastors. They were speaking at places. They were becoming worship leaders. And I living in Hollywood had started hating it so much that I now had flipped to the other side of, I don't want anything to do with celebrity culture and all of that. I do want to just like work for God. (laughs) Right. So Bethel seemed like the answer. Um, and my main hope was that my husband at the time would have an encounter and that it would Mm. change him. (laughs) That was, you know, I knew as as a Christian wife, all I could do was pray for him. So I was like, maybe this is going to be the the solution for us. And Mm -hmm. and I felt like my calling couldn't go further until we were both doing better. So we went to Bethel and um, I was looking forward to being there and just like learning and spending time with God. And I was immediately told that I needed to audition for worship team by everyone. That that's what God wanted me to do. And I was like, I don't know. I really don't want to do this. I just want to take a break. And they're like, no, we really think you should. And if, if you're not supposed to, then you won't make the audition. <laughs> <laughs> you know how they do that. Yeah. So um, I made the audition. I became one of the worship leaders and Bethel's, I don't know if it was like this when you were there, but their the culture surrounding their worship leaders <laughs> was just as toxic as every Bible study with celebrities I went to in LA. It's really messy. It's really messy. I, 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 I'm a weirdo. I don't like music. So I don't really listen to music. I don't care about <laughs> it. And so I even more so don't really give a shit yeah. about Christian music. Right. Cause I mean, let's yeah. be honest, that's down the it's totem pole. Um, yeah. But I was really close to a lot of the musicians at Bethel uh-huh. lived with different ones. Um, and so I was often in the kind of like, loop of what's going on here what's happening and it is yeah it's just fucking insane like on a whole yeah. level that most of bethel just never really got um like it was a whole nother level whole nother level um mm-hmm. and that was i don't know however long ago i can't imagine it got better um no. so the stories i hear it, coming out again and again over the years i mean we've had it's a lot so of bad and 
just nut stuff um yeah but yeah it's it's a weird thing though like i mean i remember like when i went we were a class of i think 650 people so this was a mm. small class back then mm-hmm. i mean this is when it was starting to get big and people were like wow look how big it is and that's actually really small compared to what they're churning out these days um but off that i think they had like 120 people apply for a worship team you know it, it wasn't like a small deal to make the worship team everyone wanted on it everyone was a big deal wherever they were coming to Bethel and suddenly realizing actually you ain't shit and right. so if you were <laughs> shit if you did make it fuck yeah hello I'm <laughs> literally the next fill in the blank right Kim Walker Smith yep. Mike Johnson Will Matthews whoever it was at the time um that was a big deal like you were a big deal if you could make it onto like the worship team just for the school as well you're not even right. like on the stage Sunday morning things like that that was you know, but the school level, is but that was the funnel right. into it yeah well the school is the civic center so it's huge i mean it's right it's you, like a lot of musicians don't get to perform on that right. level just in the secular world so it's a it's a yeah they treat it like a very big deal yeah. <laughs> and it is in its own little way it's a big deal for sure but when you're like a immature 20 year old that's like being told by the way you're the best of the best and look at this it's hot shit and it but and the only reason you're here is because you god meant it to be right because right. you didn't even want to be here and look what god did he made it happen anyway yep. so clearly this is a god thing it's not like some random person on the team going yeah we like the way that she looks she sings she she acts the way she does on stage <laughs> she's in oh don't right. like that person they don't have the right look or oh people of um they have people of that race they well, they can be problematic oh, yeah. literal oh, things yeah. to come out of bethel's of mouth yeah yep. um yep. and so yes yeah, and, and that's not unique to bethel either but um yeah some really really fucked up shit goes on in those places <laughs> for sure so yeah well and i i hated it because that's kind of like what i was trying to get away from mm. and i was so disturbed i think i was just very naive about the church in general um because I had had a lot of positive experiences in, in my early teen years. And so every time something new, like my divorce and now this would happen, I was just like, is this like, what is, did I just miss this giant red flag this whole time? Because I started, you know, I'm on the worship team and the celebrity culture for Bethel's school worship team, not like you said, not even the main one. If I went to Trader Joe's, if I went to Target, if I went anywhere, there was somebody coming up to me asking me not just to take a picture with them, but to pray for them, to anoint them, to like, to tell me about this encounter they had that, you know, I led worship during and it's this big thing and blah, blah, or to prophesy over me. Like I could not go anywhere. And because of all of the stuff I was going through personally and in my marriage, it was giving me the worst anxiety. I was so depressed. Um, And of course, what I was hearing from my pastors is that this is the test of God for the calling on my life and what's Mm. to come and all of that. And that I am like Esther supposed to, you know, all all the stuff they tell you, like, this is my time to learn about all of this. And meanwhile, I'm like, I just want this to stop. Like I need help. This is too much for me. I don't want this. I don't like it. People are asking me to sign their Bibles. It's weird. And I was disgusted that this was the same Mm. culture I just came from in Hollywood, but worse because I thought we were supposed to be better than this. (laughs) And, uh, and we weren't. Yeah. It was was weird. There's, there's no room for critique about things when they work the way they're supposed to work. There's, there's plenty of room for when someone steps out of line and goes, Hey, I want to leave worship slightly differently or Hey, I don't like yeah. the fact that we're just doing this or, Hey, I don't like the fact that we're tokenizing me and I'm the only black person here and it's yep. not cool. Or, you know, these kind of things immediately shut down, you know, you're, you're deceived or you're, you're being uh, influenced by Satan or whatever, you know, like right. all these kind of things. But when you are successful and you kind of do want the same things as the church, you know, you like the general theme, right? You're like, yeah, I do want to see the seven mountains transformed to look like the kingdom <laughs> of God. Yeah. I do want, you know, to be, um able to serve god the best way i can and yeah i do believe the same kind of core values as bethel but i feel overwhelmed by this and i don't really like the attention on me can we do something about it it's like no 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 we want the attention on you we we need that that's part of the system right. we like yeah. that like that's part of the whole seven man system right um yeah. when they talk about taking over like the business realm they're not talking about the janitor at starbucks no right <laughs> they're talking about you have to be a ceo right this is the whole thing everyone has to be the top 
you know everyone has you to get be the best, to be the yeah. best the best the best um which then is it's a whole nother kind of layer of this seven mountain thing which becomes toxic right is because absolutely everyone thinks well i have to become a hollywood superstar actor and it's like odds are guys right? there's, there's a lot <laughs> of you here and there's only so many whatever um yeah. and it, it's so they don't like it when you are the success and you're struggling or you don't like that system or you, you there's some critiques right. you have like it's it's a problem because you're highlighting systemic issues and yeah. there's no space to talk about systemic issues the system right. is set in stone oh yeah yeah and i was told that it was um the posture of my heart that was taking it a certain way and that i needed to look at that and i was saying I'm telling you, people are literally coming up asking to take pictures of me, saying, saying the same things that my celebrity friends in LA would have people approaching them with. I'm not reading into this. It's happening yeah. and it's not okay. And I was being told that just shows where my heart is at because it's just it's just the Lord's anointing on me that they're attracted to. And now I'm trying to credit it to myself. <laughs> so the way they twist it, and then I felt like a horrible person for that. I felt like, yeah. oh, they must be right. This is my worship pastor. Like I'm doing, you know, I'm being prideful. It's that shame that they put on you so then I mm -hmm. felt bad about that and I just tried to do even better and I tried to do even better um and meanwhile Trump has just been elected <laughs> and we're holding like I can't I'm so excited that I talked to someone that was at Bethel <laughs> in that era because I was there it's when they were like so telling everyone not to vote for the black Christian and vote for Mormons right. and things like that right which right. was like wait you hated Mormons last week right? right like but here yes. we are right so that was fun like 2000 yeah eight through 2012 but like to be there Ugh. then jesus like that caused <laughs> well, me to question shit like and i was yes. in the uk as well so i was already like what is happening but like to be there at that time must have been <laughs> next level it was crazy <laughs> well it was really weird for me because i also had sorry i'm going on different rabbit trails oh, this but, is what this podcast is about rabbit well, trails all the way perfect <laughs> then I, then i'm good for it when you know in 2008 when um barack obama was elected my dad he had obviously been saying that we shouldn't vote for him, blah, blah. And then uh, at church here in Atlanta, he saw that morning, like after the election, um, that anybody in our church that was a person of color, and we were pretty diverse, was really excited and wanted to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And yet we're trying to hold themselves back. And he stopped, I remember him going up and he like stopped everything and said, we are going to celebrate today because we have our first black president. And our brothers and sisters are here right now and they want to celebrate and we mm. should be celebrating this. Like, this is a good thing. And I remember just being like, whoa, this goes against everything I thought that yeah. I was supposed to think growing up. And that was the start of a giant progression for my parents. I mean, they, they, um, as far as in the evangelical world, it not, sure. they were not woke, but they were, <laughs> they were ahead of a lot of things. And so my dad started taking a lot of flack for that. You know, he, I bet. he, had positive things about Barack Obama all the time throughout his presidency. He started talking about how the world was doing better and better than it ever had. He started sharing the positive things. Um, my mom celebrated with me the day that uh, the Equal Marriage Act passed. We were we were just so excited. She was like, "This is a this seems just like a good thing, like the way you should celebrate." So they were really progressing. And then <laughs> the the whole campaign season started with with Donald Trump. And um, I was really into Bernie and I, my dad and I love to talk politics. We did then, we don't now, <laughs> but we, you know, <laughs> I would share different things. I would be like, check out this guy that I found, you know, Bernie Sanders seems really cool. And uh, my dad was liking him and we were having fun watching the debates. Um, and then <laughs> I remember my dad saying, well, I actually had a dream last night that, that Donald Trump won and he's going to win. And I was like, you are kidding. Like, please don't go down this path. And he started down that path and was one of the first to come out and say that he thought Donald Trump was going to win. And that wow. is what got him a lot of attention. And in the beginning, he said, I don't like this. I hate it, but I think it's God's judgment on us, basically this whole thing. And then it wow. just spiraled from there. So I'm at Bethel where they're holding like intercession services for Donald Trump and like singing his praises and like literally worshiping is what it looked like. I mean, yeah. actually worshiping. <laughs> and, um, and then I'm hearing stuff from my parents ministry back home where they're starting to talk more and more positively and releasing these prophetic words about 
Donald Trump and how he's God's anointed and all this stuff. And I, I just like lost my, my point of reference for everything I thought about Christianity and evangelicals and, and people that I love dearly because I was seeing all the awful stuff coming out <laughs> about Donald Trump. And I was yeah. surely now, surely now you'll be done. I mean, we all did that. Right. Surely now we're over this and it, yeah. it would encourage them even more. So that was very weird. And, and Bethel was obsessed with Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Um, that's they they right. always have been so obsessed with, it didn't really matter which candidate it was always as long as it's a Republican. Like, I mean, that's always, and they, it's always, well, you have to vote because of abortion. It was always that, that was the kind of the, right. the veneer on it. But there's always been at Bethel and throughout the majority of evangelical churches, right? This thing of like, well, we need this right wing vote. We yep. need the Republican vote. At the end of the day, that's all it comes down to. Christianity is Republican. Absolutely. You go into the historically black church and Christianity is, huh, oh, democratic. Oh, interesting. Right. Like it's, it's, it's fascinating how Christianity can be something so different to so many people. I guess being in Atlanta, right. that makes a lot of sense. Assuming you were fairly central, like you would have a very yeah. diverse uh, group of people. Um, yeah. It, it but, was diverse for evangelicalism for sure. And I yes, think that is and, what and helps us be more yeah. progressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're never going to find an evangelical church that's predominantly black. I'd imagine uh, that's got to yeah. be a pretty uh, slim pickings out there, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a like a shock to the system because I was already long out at that point. Mm, so I okay. mean, I watched I watched the the elections like 2008, 2012, and I came in as a Brit who was already like a total ridiculous liberal progressive just because <laughs> I'm British, right? So even right. if I was right wing British at the time, that would be on your You're left. Still, like, so our left, I yeah. was like, oh, this guy Barack seems like he's might bring some sanity to whatever the fuck's yeah. happened in America so far because we're watching Bush, right? This is coming at Bush era. And the rest of the world is going, come on, guys, <laughs> we could do better. Do it together, um, yeah. And now, like, after the last, like, four years, everyone in America was, like, kind of like, could we go back to Bush? Like, we don't right. need Obama. We'd go back to Bush over this guy. <laughs> like, yeah. um, but, like, the 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 degree to which people, it just shows the degree that to which we have to dive into our cognitive distance. We have to just go all yeah. in. Like, that you're hearing this guy, you said he's going to win, and now your favorite prophet is saying, you know, oh, look, this this passage talks about Trump, and look, this I got this <laughs> prophetic words or whatever. And, and the more you're hearing it from your heroes, the more that you get some sort of feedback as well, maybe you had a dream like your dad, who knows, um, the more you're like, this, it, this is the only way it works, right? It's like, I don't know if I want to get married, but this is the way it works, right? I don't know if I yeah. want to be a superstar, but this is the way it works. I've just got to yep. figure out what the pride is there. I've got to just figure out how we accept a guy that boasts about grabbing people's pussies. Like I just got to figure right. it out. Like it, it, it was, it was so terrifying to watch. Like, I think it was Rick Joyner. Um, I don't know mm. how many people who listen to this will know of that, but oh, I'm I, grew, sure you'll, I grew you'll, up going you'll grew up, to his yeah. conference. Yeah. <laughs> so, but Rick Joyner, I think it was, who was like after that particular leak or whatever it was, um, you forgive me, I don't know the details, but like the one where he talks about grabbing people and sexually assaulting young yeah. girls. And he he goes, This is this is the way God's always worked, you know. Like, really, <laughs> honestly, God only has ever worked by redeeming really broken men and, and going in and he's found someone that's so broken that actually it'll be an amazing example to and you're like, you're watching someone go, How the fuck can I turn this around? And and people that have right. so I don't know if you, you've experienced this, but I know when I used to do prophetic words. You start with anything, right? You start with like, oh, it's a I see a tree, right? And then you're like, yes. okay, let's talk about a tree. Wow, I see you planting deep roots and and you're bringing forth fruit. 100%. And even though sometimes the tree looks barren, that's because it's it's getting some resources from the ground and it's gonna have a bigger season next year and produce more fruit. And that's what I see in your life, right? And we we just make shit up from anything. Oh, absolutely. And, and this is what it was. It was just watching the whole evangelical world to go right grab them by the pussy how do we okay how do we so spin this? it's like oh, you watch and you watch and you're like they're doing it they like, did it they're doing it and people are listening and going hmm, yeah gosh yeah god must be just choosing a real terrible person to to show his goodness and how amazing could right. possibly be we just look to a decent guy who's put in the work for 60 plus years which by the way yeah. we shouldn't be voting for anyone that's done work for 60 years um like can we right. vote for people that aren't like see now um right. I know Bernie's not see now but jesus no, like, but you're right. why are these the only choices yeah. um <laughs> yeah. but like you know it couldn't possibly be that we just go maybe god could use someone like bernie who's like a bloody stand-up guy like 
like god forbid he does that no and we've got to find a terrible person a good person yeah <laughs> right and it's not like the last election cycle they were like well this is the worst the republican party's put forward so it's clearly god's choice no this is you're backed into a corner with the one guy that you want and right. you're just making shit up that hasn't been yep. true the last 10 election cycles that you tried to talk someone in and right. it's so but it but it works right and and you talk to people and it feels like you're going insane it feels like you're oh, just yeah. I, i'm like how you're speaking to me and i feel like you're not even hearing the words you're saying yeah. i can't make sense of this but it's irrelevant it, it, you know it's just it just is not being processed on some fundamental level it's it's just honestly fascinating to to watch go down and we watch it in all sorts of areas right we watch it just with talking to christians about christianity sometimes um but with trump like watching evangelicals that have like pushed purity culture for you know a few decades <laughs> be like okay we have to sell trump it's like jesus this is going to be fascinating to watch um i i obviously had the beauty of being removed by you know a few thousand miles that it was more fascinating so lucky. And terrifying um but yeah gosh I, sorry i don't know it's just a whole world um yeah. so you're there trump era that shit's going well, down and i had just come from living in la where i had made friends that that looked different than me that had different lifestyles than me that weren't Christians um, and were some of the most beautiful, loving, kind, amazing people I'd ever known. So that already had started warping with my indoctrination, which is that only Christians can um, be a true display of, of God's love. And only, um, you know, only straight white people are <laughs> uh, following God in this way. Just like the subliminal things I had been taught were now becoming dismantled just through mm -hmm. interacting with the rest of the world. I mean, a lot of that foundation had been laid you know, when I went to college for a semester, stuff like that, but it's just building on top of itself and building on top of itself. So I go from that, I'm starting to really progress in my own views and everything. Um, and the whole Black Lives Matter movement had had started, which my, right before Trump, my dad was in huge support of, um, mm. was one of the few evangelical leaders. I was constantly posting and in, in support and, um, and saying, you know, this is the the voice of the voiceless and we have to listen and not condemn what's, you know, the, with the protests and all of that. So I had my eyes open from that. And then to yeah. have the person that helped me progress now come out in favor of this mm -hmm. man that was against every Christian value I thought I was supposed to follow was very disheartening and I didn't understand it. And that is what sparked for me to start asking, like, hold up, what other like cognitive dissonant moment is happening here amongst yeah. all these leaders and then being at Bethel and and telling them like I need help like I I don't like this I need help I need help in my relationship and everything is just like being met with pray and you're doing great and keep going um that was so odd to me and I felt like I was living in some weird stimulation where I'm the only real mm. person. It was like the emperor's new clothes. Like everybody's standing there acting like the emperor is wearing these beautiful clothes. And I felt like the only one, like this fucker isn't wearing anything at all. Am I the <laughs> only one seeing this? <laughs> it really felt like just this weird and any friend I would try to reach out and out to and talk to about what was going on. I was just met with like a wall. Mm. And I think it was, I think they could tell I was on the brink of, of walking away. I've never even said that, but I'm sure my questions and the stuff I was saying was scary to all of them. And, um, and leaders don't know how to deal with that. <laughs> they, oh. they only know how to stop the questioning. Once, once you start the questioning, they don't know what to do with you. And, um, yeah. stuff got so bad in my personal life that I, uh, I realized, you know, this is a, <laughs> this is a defining moment for me. And I, basically locked myself in my room. I was crying out to God. I was like, I don't even think I believe in Christianity, but like, are you real? Is there even a God? And, um, and I was met with silence and <laughs> I started reading more about science and I'd already been learning about the Bible and learning so many things that I was like, wait, are we just gonna <laughs> not question that? <laughs> like, that's a big deal. Like, we're not, we're just gonna not, okay, we're moving forward. All right. Um, so, I, you know, learning about science, learning more about the Bible, learning about other religions. And mm. then, you know, for me, I, I came to the point where I was like, oh, I don't think there's a God at all. And mm. I suddenly felt 
more free than I had ever felt in my life. Wow. Um, it was literally was that immediate, like, like when you kind of came to that conclusion, you felt yeah. free. Wow. Oh yeah. It was like, I remember the moment. Um, and I bought a one-way ticket back to Atlanta. Uh, I packed one bag and, and I left, I left my marriage. I left everything. Um, and it's one of the best decisions I've ever made in my wow. life. <laughs> I flew back to Atlanta. I didn't go back. And I told my, my pastor that I'm leaving. Um, I tried to do everything the biblical way. Right. <laughs> and you guys did not help me like this. You yeah. did not give me good answers. And they were kind of like, good, go, go do your searching and God will bring you back. And here I am five, yeah. six years later. <laughs> he's, he's, he's taking a long way around, you know, he'll bring you yes, back. Yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, so that, that, that was me that leaving. just sounds amazing, right? I mean, that's the, you watch the movie and you see it come together and the, the hero, you know, they go, <laughs> fuck this shit i'm at and you're like yes you go girl yes <laughs> right like you know that is the moment like and i'm listening to your story and i'm like fuck yes i, I <laughs> love it um and and it's really exciting to you know hear you kind of like immediately be like wow yes i'm free i'm good i can get up and go i've got autonomy i've got this kind of like yeah self um suddenly that you know you have control over you're not uh, you know handing it over to leaders to husband to whatever um that's pretty rare in my experience working with people most people go through a pretty terrifying kind of season when they start to yeah. really go okay this this isn't real there is no god or you know what like yeah. in my experience again I, anecdotally i don't have the hard data for this um we're working on that we, we hopefully we'll have some data in the next year or so Love um that. but yeah like i mean do you, do you think there's something about you, about your journey that, that made it so easy for you when you did snap? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, right. can you see what I'm saying there? Cause I, I don't know, totally. maybe you talk to people as well. Like, but um, no, I, I when think I talk right. to people, they're I, like, holy weird. shit, there is no God. but actually I'm terrified there is a God and maybe I'm going to hell just even contemplating there is no God or, you know, all right. these, or, oh my God, like, well, if there is no God, what am I doing with my life and how will I move forwards or what will I do next? And there's so much fear fear and, and terror a lot a lot of time that yeah. it can just overwhelm any freedom that might be there f to be to be felt and experienced it feels like that for a lot of people is something that comes mm -hmm. in after quite a while of processing and stuff yeah yeah it, I, I do think my story is a little bit more unique um hearing other people's it is a bit of a longer process but for me so i remember when i went through my my first divorce um a lot of people in the church were really upset that I seemed so happy. They mm. were like, she just got a divorce. They were calling my dad. She just got a divorce. She's posting on social media that she's out doing fun stuff with friends. And she seems so happy. And we just don't think it's appropriate. And I remember being like, hold on. Are people upset that I'm happy? But right. what, my, what I explained and then what my dad helped communicate um, I had gone through, like, I had already grieved that relationship. I had already questioned all of it. I had already been through everything difficult and reached the point where I could not stay. Um, and leaving was the happiest, most freeing moment for me. And I was just ready to be happy and ready to be yeah. free. And, and so to me, it's just like that with, um, with leaving Christianity, I, all those questions had kind of built on themselves. Um, and I am such a analytical person that I had already kind of been thinking through. And as you see, I'm the type where once something clicks, it's really hard for me to, to unclick it, which right. is both good and bad. Um, and so I think there were so many things I had already asked everything I possibly could by the time I got to the, like, do I even believe in a God question? I was so ready to be done with the idea of hell, done with the idea of some external yeah. force deciding my life for me. Um, and it, I think it had never, I had never fully connected with that. I had never felt like there was um, some, you know, God looking out for me and, and moving things in my favor. I felt like I had been looking out for God my whole life. Like yeah. I had been like, oh, I will credit you with this. Deep down, I feel like I'm the one that did this. Deep down, I feel yeah. like that was pure coincidence. Deep down, I feel like my parents did that for me. But no, that was God's hand in my life. And I felt like I was so sick of crediting um, a source for something that I didn't think was even 
a real source. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So it, I think that's what helped is I think that deep down it, it had never felt real. I knew that mm. I was real. I knew that I was all in. I knew that I had been authentic. And since I had already been in relationships where I watched myself do that and give everything and try to credit the other person for it, I realized I had been doing that with my relationship with, with God. And, um, I had been through enough where I was like, no, fuck this. I have gotten myself here and I'm going to get myself out. Yeah. And, and I, I totally had the moments too, where I was like, in this night where I was just up and like, is there even a God? I was like, kill me, kill me now. If you're real, like, fuck you and do something, <laughs> anything. Like I'll say the worst it. thing in the world. If you want, like I'm being as blasphemous as I can do something. <laughs> like right. the yeah, yeah. You have killed people in the Bible for pretty much nothing. Right. Bring yeah. it. Like, come on. There's some good reasons here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm at Bethel. Like there's a lot of prophets here. Have one of them call me. They've got my number. Yeah, like, they've absolutely. Been, they've been all about imparting wisdom into my life. Uh, when I actually have just asked for help, what about now in this moment? I'm saying, God do something. And of course I'm always met with the, like, don't test the Lord, your God and all that, but fuck that. Why not? Why can't right. I? <laughs> um, and, and so I did. So I think that is what really helped yeah. is that the combination of my mind being so analytical and me being able to like I couldn't make sense of hell. So I didn't have to worry about that. I couldn't make sense of um, a one-sided relationship and me continuing to pour into it. Like if a God was good, they wouldn't want me to keep doing that. Like yeah. if a partner was good, they wouldn't want you to be the only one putting effort into a relationship. Right. So, so yeah, yeah. So once I was done, I was done. <laughs> no, that's, it's, it's exciting. I, I guess. Yeah. It, and it makes a lot of sense when you actually look, Oh, there's a story here. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it doesn't, it doesn't start and end right there. And you go, Oh, it's not God. I'm done. Like there's a ton of like wrestling. There's a ton of processing. Yeah. There's a ton of experience and, and life lived there um, that people don't see. And I think that's the thing that it always <laughs> shocks everyone. Like, Oh my God, this big celebrity pastor or worship leader or whatever musician, or it's always someone that's big yeah. deal that they talk about. Right. That, that suddenly deconstruct. And I'm like, I bet they didn't suddenly de deconstruct. I guarantee they've been leading worship for weeks months years maybe yep. even the whole time going what the fuck am i singing to yep. or you know like what is going on or yeah god look at this like weird group circle jerk we're and i'm leading it or you know like whatever you know yeah. it's like this is weird um and I, I think like it's very and but that's what often gets talked about right so it's the and this is why people go oh they must never have really believed like if it was that easy to just dis discard right. um and people don't see the hard work, the, right. you know, how much, like you had a prayer closet for God's sake. I had a prayer closet. Like I yeah. literally <laughs> put myself in a closet and it has a sliding door. I literally had to like slide it from the yes. inside awkwardly. <laughs> and then I'm in pitch black. It's a tiny little room. Like it's black. I'm just sitting there with my like trousers and you know, whatever. I don't know. Uh -huh. um, and like people don't have prayer closets if they're not in, right? right. If you're not like oh, yeah. in on this shit, you're not going to be getting up at five to pray. No one gets up at five to do anything they don't care about, right? right. <laughs> or maybe oh, like absolutely. a work that you have to do to you know pay some money. But no one had to do this shit. Like we were in. Um, right. Yeah, I, I think like, but to to be free from that, like when it is costing you mm -hmm. that shit, when it is putting you in a closet, when it is, you know, you're constantly harassed by everyone around you, when you are constantly having to perform when even when you succeed it's another reason for you to be like a failure and you have to start evaluating why are you not responding to success well why are you not doing this well oh it's some problem in you like it's just constant bypassing right it's constant oh, absolutely past who you are what you're doing yeah it's it's and, and it is the parallels of abuse in relationship with the abuse of dynamic of god and, <laughs> and even spiritual leaders is they go for days right i mean oh yeah they are there and i guess having unhealthy relationships is a really good primer for recognizing how unhealthy our relationship with god can be um yeah yeah, yeah. man that's intense <laughs> yes well i remember you know in the weeks leading up to me leaving <clears throat> um i there was a worship set that i had to do and i had been kind of getting corrected for different things i wasn't doing right in worship things like you should have had a prophetic song moment there or uh you need to dance <laughs> more during worship like that kind of thing and they're literally in your ear like you have an in-ear and your worship pastor is telling you like you're not 
uh, like you're not following the spirit right now, like stuff like that. Really, it means like you're not right. following what I'm telling you to do. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I remember this day just being like, I fucking hate this. I was so discouraged and just having so much anxiety. And I was like, you know what? Fuck these people. I am going to perform. I am going to go back to when I went to college. I I studied um, pop vocals performance. So I had wow. some knowledge of, of stage performance on this. Like, I'm going to fake this. I am not going to try to interact with God. I am not going to try to make this a spiritual moment. I am going to fake the shit out of it and, um, do an experiment and see what happens because I think this is all a bunch of bullshit. I think that I just happen to be skilled at manipulating a group of people and reading the room and following the instructions of the people that have done this before me. And I'm going to test it out because I don't think this has anything to do with God. <laughs> so I led worship that day, totally just like thinking about whatever in my head. And all right, now I'm going to raise this hand. And I see these people are crying over here. Let's bring it down. Like I was consciously doing mm. what I had been subconsciously taught to do. Right. I just like leaned into it. And that was the day where I got praise from my worship pastor for the first time. I was told wow. that I was clearly you finally listen to the spirit <laughs> exactly i the encounter i was having with god was evident i had more people come up to me that day with prophetic words about um how that that moment was like a defining encounter with god that i had just had and that it was amazing that i was able to share that with all of them like and i am right. just smiling to myself like holy shit i just figured this out <laughs> like this yeah, is yeah, yeah. fake and i confided in a friend about it and of course the friend was like well, God will use us even in those moments. And I just, I wanted to say, there's scream. no winning, you, right? Right. There's no winning. It, does he always come out on, on like, the good <laughs> side? Is there anything he can do wrong? Um, which sounds silly because of course we're taught like God can do no wrong. Right. But at this point I'm like, I'm sorry, something is going wrong here. and <laughs> It's not yeah. on my end. So, so yeah, that was a weird, I remember being like, oh shit, I think I figured something out here. <laughs> yeah, that is, it's crazy. Like, yeah, when you start to realize the dynamics at play and how to work a room. I mean, I got this like traveling and speaking. Um, oh yeah. And obviously got to do that when I was at Bethel with people from Bethel, then started to do it on my own and, and, and then really did it on my own when Bethel were like, we'd like you to do this on your own, officially mm. on your own. Um, like, <laughs> just <some laughs> dynamics there. Um, but, you know, you, you really get to work a room. You get to learn how to cold call, which is basically what prophecy is most of the time. Yeah. You know, you get to um you get to figure out like feeling the spirit and going oh this is we're we're having this maybe it'd be good if i come up and say something to the mic here and try and do this and then do that and it, it it's it's a it's a it's a skill god i like don't use it at all anymore i don't have any right. idea what that transfers to probably nothing healthy um <laughs> but i could probably sell a lot of used cars or something like that but um yeah for sure it's it's a really weird dynamic when you start piecing together these these dynamics of uh, these, these these components where you go, oh, this thing I thought was utterly profound in God, anyone could do with very minimal training, which is basically what Bethel is doing. They're doing very minimal yeah. training, going, oh, this is how you prophesy. And they're just yeah. teaching you to speak really good, nicely over people and read the room, read how they're doing, <laughs> practice it lots, right? Bouncing off. I mean, th there's a lot of dynamics yeah. there that really work well. How, how, did you, how did you process, I mean, in my experience, um, so this is anecdotal as well. We're looking at this. We'll probably have some data on this in 2024, and I'm excited about this dynamic oh, because it's really interesting. So cool. Is what, how people, the trajectory of people's faith when they are in these more extreme charismatic Pentecostal movements that see amazing things and experience amazing things in a way that maybe a lot of people that go through like a mainline church might not see many healings, might not get many prophetic words or, or things like that in the way that, you know, you and I probably got prophetic words and saw healings every day, whatever right, you can use air quotes right. for those things. <laughs> um, what's interesting is I'm really keen to see what happens to people's faith. How do they deconstruct? Like, is that different? Do, do those kind of things stick with you? Because I talk to a lot of people that go, I can't let go. I can't let go of some of these things I've seen, some of the experiences I had that time I gave a prophetic word and I really didn't know. And I just said something that I just could never have known. And, and it happens to be true. That guy did li like live at a house with a blue door when he was four. How the fuck would I have known that? You know, like, right. and it, people kind of grab onto these like little things or they saw a miracle, a healing or something, and they can't explain it. Um, 
do, do, how did you go through processing kind of the more miraculous components? Because I'm sure you you had experienced some stuff. Uh, maybe at times you felt like you were drifting in a dream going like, is this a Truman Show? Like, what the fuck? But I'm sure right. at times you probably were like, whoa, this is amazing stuff. I'm seeing, right? You wanted to go to Bethel for yeah. a reason. You you saw that there was stuff there that you wanted. You you felt some authenticity, uh, at least for a distance, maybe not when you got too close. How did you navigate that kind of stuff as you started to lose your faith or as you kind of lost your faith overnight even maybe yeah i think you know that's some of the stuff that i've still been unpacking because you, as you heard once i was done i was like no like i'll figure the rest out later but i've at least figured out the biggest puzzle right. piece to me so yeah but, if there's um, no god you don't need to figure out how to right i was it. like i'll figure out the rest there's no god. Also, <laughs> right <laughs> also i i was so skeptical my entire life and i don't know why um, but I've just always been a pretty skeptical person. And I think a lot of it is because I grew up around people that were always like claiming faith healings and prophetic stuff. And I would kind of see behind the curtain and be like, mm. wait, that didn't seem fully real. So I, it always made me skeptical of stuff. And I also just with my analytical mind, I was like, okay, then how come this person that we prophesied and prayed over that was going to live just died of cancer and he's five years old? Like, how come this, like, it wasn't making sense to me. So I just always felt skeptical. Um, and, but funny, funny enough, I started leading prophetic teams when I was 12. It was one of my dad's like things that he was proud of me for, that he had taught me how to prophesy so young. Um, Church must have loved that shit, by the way. 12 year old yes. that prophesies. And I, and I was leading teams with like 40 year olds on it in other countries. Uh, and we'd have government leaders. These aren't the same 40 year olds that are then approaching your dad going, um, when will she be on the market? Right. <laughs> Not those ones, thankfully okay. <laughs> <laughs> that I know of. Um, but it was, yeah. So I got to experience that obviously firsthand. I was practicing it myself. Looking back, it was my trauma response of being so intuitive and yeah. so hyper vigilant. Um, that's where a lot of my anxiety comes from. I can read people's moods or at least convince myself that I can in any situation I can pick up on stuff. I pay very close attention to anything about anyone. If I hear something being said about someone, I remember it. You know, I was a very mm. nosy little kid too. <laughs> so we'd have, um, a lot of the prophetic rooms we did, we'd go to other countries, specifically Peru. And that's where my, my dad grew up as on the mission field. Right. And because it was seven mountains, we would meet with generals and congressmen and that kind of people. Um, and they would come in and there'd be like five of us and we'd sit and pray and then prophesy over them and have a translator. And I was known for telling people the dreams that they had the night before. And cause I would just say the weirdest shit. I mean, I'm a 12 year old and I would close my <laughs> eyes and I'd be like, what do I see? And I would tell them what I saw, you know, it was that childlike faith. Um, and and then there was like, there was an incident of a guy who uh, came in and I had no way of knowing this. He had a severe speech impediment and he could barely talk at all. And I told him that God was calling him to be a pastor and that he was going to be an amazing speaker and all this stuff. And he got angry and left. Um, and then God ended up healing him was the story. And then he was an evan evangelist and could speak amazingly. Well, also, like psychologically, what does it do to somebody to have like someone prophesy over you and say you're going to speak and God says this? Well, mm. I would imagine that would help <laughs> with whatever is going yeah. on psychologically with with the with how your speech is impacted. Um, so there's different things like that that I've unpacked, and I also think I'm definitely very much an atheist. I'm definitely not uh, a mystic atheist. I know there are some of those, but I do think there's stuff we haven't figured out yet when it comes to how connected the world is. And mm. um, and I think there's probably a bit to that. I think most of the time it's coincidence and it's pure luck and it's also hypervigilance and and reading into right. things and, um, and knowing more than you've let on and then exposing that in a way that seems prophetic. Um, but I think those times where there's things where I'm like, huh, I really don't know what happened there. Like mm. there's weird shit like that that happens to me all the time still. I think all of us right. face that. And instead, now I've learned to just be like, huh, that's interesting. Maybe one day we'll right. figure that out. <laughs> because I see no reason to assign it to anything else. Because there's also yeah. psychics out there that are trying to scam people that that get it right sometimes. There's also mm -hmm. um people that practice uh religions that Christianity frowns on that and and I was taught they were harnessing the power of Satan. But right. um 
but how can we all like, how is this like a common human experience to me? It makes yeah. more sense that there's just stuff we haven't figured out yet. Yeah. So that, I don't know if that answers that question. No, that's, but that, it's good. That's, it's great. That's how I figured that out. And I never saw any yeah. healings where I was like, Oh, someone's arm just grew back in front of me or like, right. <laughs> Oh, they were completely blind and I've known them my whole life. And now they can see it was like, who's this random person that just came off the street. And now they're saying they can see, you know, it, nothing ever yeah. stood out to me. Like, Oh, without a doubt, that was a real healing. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's just, I love, I love asking people this because they always give such um, interesting um, answers because uh, obviously this is like <laughs> stuff that sits with us. This is stuff that, yeah. I mean, this is the reason we got up and, you know, went to work, you know, whatever work was like, this right. was all of us, you know, we were in like, oh, and yeah. so like coming to terms with that, reprocessing that re kind of calibrating, like what, what was going on there. It's, it's just so intriguing um that people do that in different ways like you said some people are quite mystical in their atheism um other people go into other faiths they start exploring taoism buddhism you know hinduism islam or you know all sorts of different stuff um and i don't think there's a black and white right path for anyone i think you know people will figure out what works for them um mm. but it is really interesting have you seen darren brand's miracles on netflix I haven't, but people keep so telling good. me I you, need to. You need to, to watch it. <laughs> Darren Brown, I mean, Darren Brown is a UK treasure. Like, I mean, he's he's one of the, the smartest people on the planet at, at yeah. helping people think something that they didn't want to think um, or that they didn't know that they should think or whatever. And the, the fact that he healed people all over the UK on his tour, none of which probably had much faith in God, while telling them, I'm pretending to be a Christian you know miracle worker <laughs> i'm going to use all the language that they use but i am an atheist and i do not believe in any of it and i am lying to you but some of you are going to be healed let's go and he just does a fake healing service and it's weird to watch because you're like yeah he could be bill johnson right now he's 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 good right. he, he he knows his shit he grew up he's he grew up in the church you know he knows his shit um and the fact is like years later, I, I read an interview with someone that was like four years later that got healed of like, I think it was like ME or something like that. Um, you know, people got healed all throughout the country in his stuff and it stuck. Um, and he does neuro neurolinguistic programming, right? He helps the brain rewire. He, he, yeah. he literally manipulates your brain to think differently and be differently. And his message is, yeah, there are miracles in this world. The biggest miracle is that you have the power to make yourself ill and make yourself well. That mm -hmm. is a huge deal. Now, not all illness is manipulatable in that way, but right. much of it is. And that's a miracle um, just because we don't have a full understanding of how it works. That's how it works, right? You see a guy in the Bible that's falling on the floor and having seizures and they bring him to God, Jesus and go, can you heal this guy? And he's like, yeah, he's got a bunch of demons. We look at that and go, well, he has an <laughs> epilepsy or something like epilepsy, that, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? What's the difference between epilepsy and demons? 2000 years ago right i mean like right. fuck we don't have doctors yet like you know i mean it's like of course he has demons yeah. sure that, that's the word that works at the end of the day he got better that's a good thing you know so like it's like we can um i i think we still do the same thing right today we still do it we see something we don't understand and we go god finger straight to there and go that's god <laughs> and that can be really helpful and help and healthy response for some people maybe um right but i think it's it's also very helpful for people to recognize oh, I don't have to put my finger on that and go, that's God. I can go, oh, it's something we don't know the answer to yet and we'll probably figure out. Or, ah, don't really need to know. Who cares? It's just cool Great. what happened. Like there's yeah. more options than going, oh, I don't understand. Must be some superpower. Like, right, there's a, a big jump a between. Jump. <laughs> yeah, to go from like, oh, this person's headache went away in this prayer service. So the evangelical Christian God must be true. And now I'm going to base my entire life around it. That is just right. too big of a leap for me. But that is what gets some people hooked is that inability to like stop and be like, oh, wait, <laughs> let's think about this for real. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. and that's the power of these kind of structures is like, you know, you look at somewhere like Bethel and it's working for them, right? I mean, people are flooding to Bethel because of these stories, right? Most people don't go to Bethel um, just because they've got good music, right? That's what people will become aware of Bethel. Maybe they start listening to some Bethel sermons or read some books coming out of Bethel because they like Jesus culture, Bethel music, whoever's big now. I don't know. I've not listened mm -hmm. to anything from Bethel for about decades. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, that hooks people. Yeah, it's, it's popular Christian music. 
but they don't go, oh, I'm going to go to Bethel because they have nice Christian music. They hear stories, they read a book and they go, wow, someone got healed of cancer. Wow. Someone had a broken back and the pins got taken out. The metal pins dissolved and his back got strained. And it's amazing. That's a shit. I mean, I packed up my bags in England, in Scotland, got up, got on a plane, flew across the world, gave mm-hmm. away everything I had just to be there to go. I need to check it out. I don't even know if it's real, but I'm checking it out. Like it's a powerful draw for a lot of people who, for whatever reason, do see the the quote unquote miracle and go, God, definitely God. Um, and it's intriguing to me that that is the default, you know, the way that you or I might see that now. And, and especially because we're on the other side of it, it's maybe a little bit easier for us to go, oh, that's so, so easy or simple. Right. Um, but was it for us 20 years ago or whatever? Um, it's it's intriguing that it is the default, certainly in America. I think you could go into a fairly generic place in America where they aren't massively even into healing. And if you did a miracle, they probably would a miracle again. They would go, right. oh, that was God, right? I mean, I think that would be a really default response in a lot of America to a lot of Americans. Um, it's a weird dynamic. I don't know how, yeah, I don't know how you, you, yeah, and maybe maybe we don't need to have a different response. Maybe they don't need a different response. Yeah. Well, and I, I think it comes back to confirmation bias too. When people, you know, they they want to believe something or they feel like they have to believe something, they are constantly looking, and I, I did this, constantly looking for validation to continue believing that thing. And so it's really easy to be like, oh, cool, I can collect this as evidence for why I'm believing this because there's not a whole lot else. <laughs> there's, you yeah. know, there's like emotions and feelings and, and an old book, but to, you know, I think, I think the idea of signs and wonders is like, oh, wait, there's something I can say. This is, see, you can't give me another answer. So I get to claim this for my belief now. Yeah. So it makes sense that people do that. Yeah. And I guess this is a big deal of like the seven mountain world, the charismatic world, especially somewhere like Bethel is the kind of testimony culture where they're, mm-hmm. they turn everything into a testimony, right? I mean, like, you know, I got a free coffee this week. Oh my God, get to the front, tell people about how God gave you a free coffee. You know, like, and so you're constantly racking up these things to sit in the bank balance of like, here's yeah. all the confirmations that God exists. Whether we might not look at it critically and go, God, most of this is, I got a free coffee. There's not that many arms growing. Like, but if you have one or two big things all the other things seem to just kind of tally up just as much. You don't really look too close at them. You're like, well, I'm just getting lots of feedback here. Right. I mean, Bethel, beginning of most services, they have people sharing stories about how people were healed and how they saw this happen or how they got this. And you don't even need to see this stuff. You're hearing it every day. They're constantly telling you stories about people that have saw something or seen something. And you're like, well, I, at least I know that person. Just that is pretty cool to know yeah. someone that saw a healing. Um and so, yeah, you're racking up these overwhelming lists that do kind of keep you going. I think it certainly kept oh, yeah. me going a long time. Like I, I, I believed. Like, and I, I saw like the sausage being made a lot of the time. Like I, I yeah. got pretty, pretty. I was pretty in the the inner world of Bethel, um, and you know, I saw some shit. Like uh, there's a, there's one pastor at Bethel. I don't know if he's still at Bethel, um, who used to tell a story about a thumb growing back that got, um, was missing. Um, oh, wow. and what's interesting is I was in this meeting. It was when we were traveling and oh, no. it was someone that had a sore <laughs> thumb and it got healed. But by the time he got back to Bethel, he was telling a story Ooh. about how a guy had a missing thumb and, and you've got, and we were there and we're listening to him tell these stories on the stage. And we're like, maybe over coffee being like, that didn't happen. What a crazy idiot or what a dick or whatever but we didn't really address this we didn't really yeah. expose it yeah. we didn't you know and and it didn't make me question all the other things i had seen that i didn't question um, or like, i had heard because i wasn't <laughs> i was there for that one i wasn't there right. for all these other ones that i totally believe it's a weird dynamic right you're, you're believing ones you haven't seen and the ones you have seen weren't entirely lining up with what's being sold um because a sore thumb being healed eh okay sure whatever a thumb going back i'm like fuck i'm in we're god done right i mean i'm like i don't know maybe some totally magical power that's not god maybe but fuck i'm gonna go god if a thumb grows back i'm i'm in right even to this day i'm like i'm i'm starting to question my lack of faith if i see a thumb grow um from nothing no thumb thumb 
right. amazing, right? Um, and and so you hear that testimony, you're like, fuck, this guy just saw a thumb grow back. Like you don't really question it. Um, you're not in a culture of questioning. You're told not to question. You're 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 encouraged. You're you're rewarded for believing, right? There's this kind of like yep. underlying current of like, wow, you you just believe God's anointed. You believe these messages. Well, that's great. Well done. You know, you've great faith. Um, yeah, it's it's a really it's a weird place to be in. And it does take mm-hmm. a lot to kind of start to deconstruct that, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's really, really wild. Well, and it's yeah. extremely wild that we don't have video footage of anything like that. You yeah. know, I, I especially yeah. places like Bethel, where their whole thing is that they do signs and wonders. Um, yeah. And yet, with all these amazing videos and infographics they put together, they haven't managed to capture a visible healing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, they have people telling their testimonies and, and stuff, but nothing like a limb growing back, nothing where y- you can watch that and be like, Oh shit, that was God. Um, yeah. Well, there's the guy that offers a, he offers a million dollars for anyone that has a, a video of, of, of an arm growing back. Right. Or even oh, wow. just, even just someone that has, documented proof they didn't have an arm and now does that'll do no, you know you don't have to yeah. see it happen like i mean fuck you got an arm back um, right. <laughs> but that's the thing i think i can't remember the website but it was like um i think it's like god hates amputees.com or something i don't know what it is but like it's something like Shit. that um <laughs> and uh it's genius and he literally yeah. is like i will give a million dollars to anyone that can do it and right. and it is the thing it's like i'm sure if you sat down and looked through the data i don't know how different reading's hospitals data is compared to the next town down Right? right it's probably very similar and it should be very different when you've got two thousand people every day going out from school and trying to heal every person while they they're shouldn't picking up their milk though. right <laughs> there just shouldn't be um yeah. yeah it's it's yeah i i, I often look back at that one i just think wow what a fucking trip that was it was a wild wild <laughs> yeah. one um yeah yeah it's it's a really surreal world to to live in that most people probably listen to this are like i have no idea what these two are talking about this is insane but there are a bunch of us out there that it's it's a weird niche that we've lived in and we're trying to unravel and 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 kind of piece together um yeah. yeah so how long did it take for you to kind of find um sort of a stability with your atheistic faith was was there a bit of a transition of because it's one thing to go right i don't believe in god but i think there's like a hundred kind of underlying beliefs, probably millions of underlying beliefs that start to kind of go, oh, so what do I believe about that now that I don't believe in God? That Did that yeah. take time to settle for you to kind of process, for you to kind of find your your jam, your, your role? Yeah. Well, I don't, so I don't consider uh, being an atheist to have anything to do with like my belief system or faith or anything. To me, being an atheist is just a position on, I don't believe. So I don't, I don't believe there's a God. Um, and that, happened i mean you know i told you right when it like to me that's when i i became an atheist it's when i was like oh i don't believe there's a god um however i didn't call myself an atheist that was definitely a process uh Mm -hmm. when i i moved to atlanta and i was like oh my god i can go to that mystic shop i've always thought was so cool that i thought i would get demons if i went there and i remember being scared that was some of the things i was still a little bit like i was like i don't think i'm going to hell but I'm also a little bit afraid that now right. suddenly this supernatural world is going to appear to me. <laughs> right. I don't believe in gods, but I've right. not ruled out a whole bunch of scary shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, exactly. So I, but I was like, in my head though, I knew that I didn't mm. think that that was going to happen, but it was just almost like a instinct to, to still be afraid of it. So I, yeah. I remember going to a mystic shop and I was like, I'm going to buy crystals and I'm going to buy, I didn't even know what any of this stuff was. I'm going to buy a tarot deck because I thought these tarot decks were so beautiful Mm. and I hadn't even been, you know, brave enough to look at one before. And so I got into a little bit of that and I would always be like, okay, this feels like Christianity again. Like I don't feel anything. (laughs) I mean, I could, I was like, holy shit, I could make a lot of money doing tarot deck readings for people with my prophetic gift. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That I didn't actually have, but that I was good at like reading a room and stuff. And I was like, you know, I, I could always go back into that kind of world. And I was like, no. Take over no, the tarot no, no. mansion. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
so, so I did have, I had a lot of fun, like letting myself feel free enough to, to dabble in those different worlds. And, and, um, I got really into Buddhism for a hot minute and I was like, eh. I just kept not connecting with anything. I think I really wanted to, I think aesthetically, yeah. I thought things were cool that I had not been allowed to like experience or even explore. So just the freedom. But in the back of my mind, I was always like, I still don't believe in any of this stuff. Mm. Like I'm not connecting. So, so I did dabble in that. And then, um, then I just kind of was like, huh, I don't have to be on a journey right now. Like I can just be a person. Most of my friends that I had made, they weren't really anything. Like they weren't, they wouldn't call themselves an atheist. They wouldn't call themselves really, they were just like existing, which was a new yeah. concept to me. <laughs> um, and so I, I kind of just gave myself a year to just like be, and I had a lot of crazy stuff going on in my life health wise. And I was putting myself through school and all this stuff. So, so I just kind of like was, um, I got really into Eckhart Tolle, which was awesome. Cause I think his, his, yeah. uh, wisdom about presence was something I had never learned in Christianity to like be able to yeah. sit and be with myself and to, to treat a present moment. Like it was important because I had always treated like the future as though that was what was mm. important. <laughs> the kingdom yeah. of God someday. Uh, I, I lived for the future and now learning to like, just live and be and be present. And that's all I had to do was very free. Um, and then, you know, stuff politically was just getting worse and worse with Trump, my parents' ministry was putting out just awful, awful rhetoric. And I started on Facebook every now and then I'd post a little like thing about, I had always been pretty outspoken, even in my Christian days online about what I thought about politics and all that. And I decided to get back into it, start posting a little. Well, people were taking my posts and copying and pasting them onto my parents' like prophetic words that they were releasing. <laughs> And they're like, check out her, their daughter, like what she says about all of this. Wow. And I never was like my parents, blah, blah. I would just say like evangelical leaders because it was at this point, all of them. Oh were, yeah, absolutely. Your parents weren't their only ones out there doing it. It was the thing to be doing is, is right. talking about Trump and releasing prophetic words and, and QAnon had just taken over. Um, wow. That's where all of this was coming from. They're super, super big into QAnon. So I just started posting stuff kind of like against that. Um, I have a lot of people comment. The most popular comment I still get is like, you're bringing balance to the force. Thank you. <laughs> because to have, to have my parents ministry saying one thing and me saying like, Hey, let's, let's actually talk about this. Cause this isn't okay. Um, but then once people started copying and pasting it and trying to like create tension, cause I was still trying to maintain relationship with my family. Yeah. And, and I was fine. Like I, you know, what they were putting out there was very painful and, and I hated it, but I like knew that is part of who they were. It was a lot harder for them to come to terms with me now, not being right. with them. And, um, yeah. and so it created a lot of tension and they got really upset. Um, and they, I, you know, I, I didn't have a following. I was just talking to my friends and family on Facebook and they had like a hundred thousand people reading their stuff. And, um, and I was t getting a lot of heat for it. And, mostly just relationally, I was so upset and so devastated that I had lost all common ground with my family. Yeah. And so I was like, fuck this. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm just going to go off and be a own person. And this is around the time when I was like calling myself an atheist more. Um, I, and then I had a bunch of people reach out, uh, including a family member that shocked me saying, Hey, you need to get back to this. Like what you were saying was really helpful and important to a lot of people. And don't mm. let um, your voice be silenced. Like you get to share your story too. So that's when I sat there and I was like, I guess I'll start an Instagram. What do I want to call it? <laughs> and Eve was framed as just like a phrase. I know it was really popular, I think in the seventies, um, maybe sixties mm -hmm. or seventies during the feminist movement, uh, which I didn't even know that until after I was like, let me right. do this. Cause I've, I've jokingly, I'm sure I heard it once before, but I've always been like, Eve was framed, even as a Christian, it's like, why do we blame her for everything? <laughs> yeah. Um, cause there was something so powerful to me about a woman, the first woman experiencing life for the first time and saying, fuck, I'm willing to die. If there's more knowledge that yeah. is being withheld from me, I'll, I'll take that risk. If there's a chance yeah. that I'm missing out on something, I will ask the, the questions. I'll eat the fruit. <laughs> Yeah. So, so I went, I was like, Eve was framed. Let's, let's try it. And I'll just share my story anonymously. And I don't know if anybody will connect with it, but maybe I'll find people that help me. Um, and I, I started connecting with a lot of people and then I 
decided to make a TikTok and that took off. And, um, and now it's just like its own thing that I didn't even intend for it to be. I was just looking to, to swap stories with people and feel um, like I wasn't alone and to help people feel like they're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're certainly did, like I said at the beginning, I can't remember if it was before or after we started recording, but like, I mean, I get messages a lot about you. Like people message me oh, constantly, really? like with like sharing your stuff or like oh, uh, you need to talk to this person on your show or like whatever it is. <laughs> like people are loving your stuff. And for good reason. Like because as soon as I found you online, I'm like, oh my God, this is great content. This is really good stuff. And so thank you. I think you have um yeah, I think you have a great insight. You've got a very particular way of thinking and and coming <laughs> into into these kind of conversations and exploring them. Um, I just absolutely love it. I, I love the the way that you can look at certain topics and take them apart and explore them. Um, and you do it in really lovely, wonderful ways, not aggressive, not... Because um, I think there's a lot of stigma around atheism in America. I, I think oh, what's yeah. interesting to you is, you know, talking about like, oh, I couldn't accept, you know, I didn't want to label myself atheist straight away or things like that. Right. What's interesting is in our data, so we're looking at what happens to um, people as they deconstruct. And it looks like about maybe between probably like 18 to 22 percent of people that deconstruct become um atheists across the board so it's a very small amount actually it's more than i thought whole. it would be too uh, yeah. but but that's that's controlled globally when you isolate america it drops down to 13 it okay. really drops yeah. a significant amount and what's interesting is I, I, we want to look at more data on this because it'd be really fascinating to look at like okay but what what are they believing that is there <laughs> like that gap what do they actually believe and i would not be surprised and again this is just anecdotally from talking to people i would not be surprised if more people are um pragmatically as they work, live their life they're atheists right. um but the fear of identifying with that label the consequence of identifying with that label the societal yep. kind of like stigma on the word atheist um there was a big thing uh i can't remember you saw this about five years ago there was a study done and they asked people like what's the worst thing that someone could be or whatever <laughs> and they, they found that people in america thought it was worse to be an atheist than to be a satanist I was like, that's really funny. Like, but I don't really know the, the thinking behind that, but that's what they found is across the board. Yeah. People thought it would be worse to be an atheist and not believe in God than to worship Satan, which of course you can take <laughs> apart what being a Satanist is and it's right, not particularly right. very different. Um, but it's fascinating, the stigma around atheism. Is, is that something you face a lot? I mean, I imagine most of your audience are very American. Most of my audience are very yes. American. Um, yeah. And and I, I imagine even though many of them are, God, this is oxygen. This is exactly what I need to soothe the pain to help me process, <laughs> to make me not feel alone and insane. For every one of them, there must be another person stumbling, especially on TikTok and Instagram with reels mm -hmm. and stuff. The algorithms are shit, right? I mean, they just go, oh, yeah. hey, I know who you would like this. This QAnon Trump <laughs> guy. Right? It's like, oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, this white old guy that's got an opinion. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I, I, I imagine that must be a frustrating dynamic to, to have to kind of like yeah. uh, be it's forced into. It's one of the main reasons where, because initially I wasn't going to say that I am an atheist, like when I was making this content, because I didn't want, I knew that like who I am and what I have to share is a broader audience than just being an atheist. Yeah. Um, and I know the connotations that atheism has. And so I wasn't, I was like, no, I don't want to put people off. Um, and then I started realizing that the reason why it has such bad connotations, especially in the States, especially in the South where I live, mm -hmm. is because people are afraid to say that they're an atheist. They think they also don't know what atheism is. You know, it's it's literally just the lack of belief in a God. You can be right. a Gnostic atheist, which is very rare, which is someone who says, oh, I know there's no God. But I'm, you know, most people are agnostic atheists. Like, I, I, I can't, I don't have proof that there is no God. Right. I also don't think there's proof that there is a God. So I'm not going to believe unless proven otherwise. So I think there's just a big misunderstanding around what atheism is. Also, most of the people talking about being an atheist that are saying they are, are older white men that are pretty intense. Um, some yeah. of my favorite people are, are like that. And I, you know, that helped me get the courage to say like, I am an atheist, but it's not often that there's like <laughs> a young girl that is really I'm, I'm, I think of myself as like a very nice, like warm person uh, saying, Hey, also I'm an atheist. It almost sounds contradicting right? with what I was taught about being an atheist, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I realized, Oh, 
there's a lot of value actually in, yeah. in people seeing like who I am and, and the posts I make and the, the kind of things I like to talk about and knowing like, also I'm an atheist. <laughs> mm. Um, I have a, a lot of values that, that match up with different progressive Christians and, and some of my friends that are, um, Buddhist or, uh, pagan and, and I'm an atheist because it's really just like this one facet of yeah. who I am. It's just like a position of, of lack of belief. Um, so that's why I wanted to start talking about that more and, and, um, try to remove the stigma and try to bring a little bit more diversity to, to what an atheist is. Yeah. Uh, and I've, I've had a lot of people message me saying like, Hey, <laughs> I, I followed your stuff cause I was deconstructing and you helped me realize like that it's okay to not believe that there's a God and that maybe I might even call myself an atheist someday. Cause you make it seem less scary. Awesome. And that, that is what, um, I want to keep doing this for because I yeah. think the freedom to do that and not feel like that label, uh, it's funny. Cause it's how I felt as a Christian, like. I'm going to keep calling myself a Christian, even though it has horrible connotations, <laughs> but, yeah, um, yeah. and that's why I always encourage progressive Christians. Cause I have a lot of progressive Christian friends that are like, well, I, I won't, I just call myself a Jesus follower. I'm not even going to call myself a Christian. I'm like, no, actually, I think it's important what you're doing because mm. I don't think Christianity is ever going to go away. And I think I'm fine with that. Um, but I want it to become <laughs> something different. Yeah, if it could be nicer, that'd good. be great. <laughs> yes. And and so don't stop calling yourself a Christian because you like we're depending on you guys to change this and to and to make mm -hmm. it frowned upon to be anything other than this progressive brand of Christianity. Yeah. So yeah. No, that's really good. I mean, this is so people that have followed the show for a long time will notice that I tend to have more people on that are atheists or um, some form of diverging path of Christianity, mm. um, largely because I think both are kind of um, misrepresented in this space. So a lot yeah. of people hear deconstruction and they hear deconversion, and that's not true. The data bears up that actually the majority of people yeah. go into an agnostic space, but the second majority is is people that hold on to Christian faith in one way, shape, or another. It might look nothing like what they came from. More often than not, it doesn't. But that's the second largest group, a good size group, 20, 25% in some countries, um, hold on to some form of Christian faith. And I think mm. they need to be, they need to be a vo voice in this space as well and, and represented. Yeah. But I think the atheist point, you make such a great point, right? We think of Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, you know, we think of the yep. old white men, straight, um, you know, very they're what we saw in our pulpits, right? And honestly, they're exactly. much different than what we saw in our yeah. pulpits as well. It can be really fundamental in their approach as well and quite aggressive about it. And, and I think that has a space and, and it's quite important, I think, at times for people to be fundamental about what they believe and, and even get aggressive about what they believe in, in the right space and time. Um, but I think what you're doing, actually, you've put a, a finger on the pulse of what, I, what I've not thought about why I like what you're doing so much is that you're creating space for atheistic thought in um in a way that i don't see very often um yeah. you know when we look at the data for people in lgbtq community um hardly any move into atheism it's really interesting the vast majority um, move into um uh, progressive Christian spaces and, and then secondarily um, agnostic spaces or spiritual, but not religious or something along those kind of like more ambiguous areas. Um, very, very few are atheists. And I'm always going, who are, who are atheist um, queer people in this space? How, how do I like find those people? Cause there's yeah. gotta be people that, that, that go, I want to see someone that looks like me. I want to see someone that represents me. Um, and so I'm sure, I, I, I know for a fact, a huge portion of the people that message me going, have you seen Eve was framed stuff are <laughs> women, right? That they're, they're women yeah. going, oh, I don't have to find my role model is Richard Dawkins, right? Because let's be honest, right. he's not much like me. Like, right. uh, he's not much like me, never mind like you, <laughs> never mind, you know, like a lot of other people. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think that's a beautiful thing you're doing. Um, and I think Thank it's you. really important that, you know, we have people that are representing the diversity of what it looks like to leave a conventional faith. And it is, it's like herding cats. You can't paint this with one stroke. There's a million <laughs> different flavors of what it looks like. And a big flavor of that is atheism. You know, yeah. um, that's yeah. a, a t 10, 20 percent, whatever it is, that's still tens, if not hundreds of millions of people potentially um, yeah. leaving their faith in, in the last few decades, in the coming decades. I can only imagine it keeps moving this way. 
Um, and to be a safe space for atheists um, or people that are exploring atheism to land in it and, and, and find space to explore. That's an exciting thing. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that. Oh, thank you for the kind words. I feel like in Christianity, the way I think and talk and say things was always frowned upon. <laughs> and so it's been so interesting and and validating and comforting to now have like found my people. And it, it's like, mm-hmm. no, actually, we love how your mind works. We love that you think analytically when when that was like I had to train myself to not be that way. So, yeah. So thank you. <laughs> it's great. It's great. I, and I often, I often wonder myself about my training at Bethel and how much it helps me today doing what I do. I go, ah, <laughs> maybe, maybe helps me in a lot of ways you probably wouldn't have wanted to if you knew how to right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, we start yeah, thinking yeah. Bethel school for what we do. They might not ways. like it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Put that your accreditations. Um, no, thank you. Eve, this is so fun. Really, really fun. How, how can people like connect with you if they want to like, you know, track what you're doing? We mentioned your Instagram and TikTok. Um, yeah. Is that the best way for people to track with what you're doing? Yeah. So I, I have, um, I have Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. It's all Eve underscore was framed. And I have the Facebook page. <laughs> Please, oh if you God. are, for whatever godforsaken reason, still on Facebook, come like that page because it's mostly a lot of um, like older friends that I've had that are still very, very much in evangelicalism. <laughs> so right. you can imagine they have zero grid for my content. Um, and I think that there could be some really cool conversations happening in the comments because I, I do have a respectful bunch of people in there. So that could be a fun place to hang out if, if like I said, you're still on Facebook for some reason. But yeah, other than that, um those are the places that i'm at perfect great well you know i'm not going back on facebook to do it but i i you <laughs> I, know I, I wouldn't anyone that that wants you. to you do it um yeah it's, it's weird my, my facebook was basically like that it was it was all kind of people from when i was traveling and speaking it was all kind of very happy conventional christians and i was just like why am i even talking to you you guys are happy I'm like what? i'm not gonna ruin your day and i am ruining your day every time i open my mouth you get pissy. <laughs> right. so i'm like fuck yeah. it i'm gone um yeah. so yeah um i get that that space and, it, and god if yeah. you are on facebook go be a fr- breath of fresh air because i'm sure it would be nice <laughs> Please. um yeah yeah oh this was great Eve, thank you so much i really enjoyed thank it so um much, it's I probably gonna be this. a couple of months before it comes out because i'm doing them every other week now um so it, I'll, I'll let you know when it comes out and we'll we'll okay you know, uh, put it out there and yeah, it'd be great. But uh, honestly, so fun to hear your story and, and yeah, just hear some of how you're processing and navigating the world. Um, it's been really, Thank really you. great. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sure. Yeah. Cause I, I don't share a lot of this. So I, I think, um, a lot of the people that follow me will be happy to get to hear some background. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll have you on at some point and we can talk about some atheistic, um, thought and, and explore some of that yeah. because as I'm talking, I'm like, God, most of the atheists I've had on my podcast to talk about atheism are straight white men and i'm uh, <laughs> that, done. So, it, yeah it's, it's common yeah, i think fun. i think that's who feels comfortable saying they are one so it makes sense yeah yeah and that's probably a big factor as well yeah straight white men are often very comfortable saying whatever they are because there's very few rough right. questions so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely all right Eve, thank you um, thank you I'll so much i'll catch you later yeah okay bye all right bye If you are deconstructing, there is no reason to do this alone. It can be an incredibly lonely process, but the deconstructionnetwork.com is a free resource to help you find others deconstructing in your local area. If you would like to support what I do, everything I do is for free, from talking to people for hours on end to producing resources and podcasts. Um, It is only possible because people give uh, generously. There is never any need to give. Um, It will always be free, everything I do. But if you do, we do have an amazing private community group that we talk on over on Discord um, that you would gain access to. And we do regular audio and video chats on there as well. So it'd be great to see you in there. But of course, never any requirement. And of course, please, please, please come and talk to me on Instagram. I love connecting with people. I love helping people on their journey. If you need a safe space to process your deconstruction, I would love to connect. It's just at Phil Drysdale. Love every one of you. Peace.